of uh, our House Majority Coalition press conference today. I'm especially happy to be sitting next to two members who are back. Uh, Representative Ivy Sponholtz, I'm happy is back. Representative David Guttenberg, I'm happy is back. And Representative Matt Clayman, I'm happy he never left us. Um, <laughs> The operating budget's obviously going to be on the floor this week. Uh, we don't know if it's going to be three days or 10 days. Last year, there were combined over 400 amendments from the House Minority and Finance and on the House floor, and we have no idea of knowing um, what the number of amendments will be. We hope they'll be focused. We hope they'll be researched. Um, but right now, we have a budget that's going on the House floor that uh, is $560 million less than it was in 2015. And in terms of unrestricted general funds, the tax and other funds that we have that come into the state. But it's been a $560 million cut. If you count the capital budget and other cuts since 2013, we've cut $3.5 billion from the budget. And the result of that is um, that some things, uh, there's still some areas you can find for efficiencies, but there are places you've probably cut too far. We've cut over 1,000 teachers and educators in the last five years. Um, uh, we're trying to hold the line on spending, but if it's a flat education budget, we will lose 200 more teachers statewide, teachers and educators. Um, some of us believe in an education funding increase that, uh, that passed the Education Committee uh, last week, and it's off to the Finance Committee. And the struggle right now is with the Senate that says um, we should continue deficit spending, and that's their plan. Um, and, and I understand it, and, I, and I'm not casting aspersions, but that's, that's their plan, uh, continue deficit spending with very limited savings that were once $17 billion and are now going to be below $2 billion very soon uh, to the point the public needs to understand with a crash in oil prices, there will be no savings to fund state, state government, and uh, that'll be the crisis that everybody's been warning about. Um, so. Um, that's where we are right now. Um, uh, many of our caucus members have said, look, um, uh, we know the Senate plan is to just uh, spend the permanent fund. We've had a number of our more conservative colleagues. Minority Leader Millet had a $1,000 PFD plan. The Senate has their PFD plan. Uh, but you can't just um, spend down the permanent fund uh, without, without any other revenue and deficit spend your way to no money. One easy fix uuh, would be just a simple a uh, 25% tax on only those oil companies that are making profits, a 25% tax on profits. It's about what you and I pay to the federal government. Uh, according to the Department of Revenue, that would raise $550 million this year and $700 million next year, and we would actually have something very close to a balanced budget. So we could start building up a construction budget to put people back to work. Um, so that's where we are on education. That's where we are on the budget. Um, uh, I would uh, I, I just, because uh, it's me and you know I'm going to say this, I, I was thrilled to see 25 fo uh, foster youth come down on their own, on their own dime last week to educate legislators about their circumstances, uh, about a life that leads to over 20% of them in jail at some point and over 50% of them in homelessness less, uh, uh, without changes and all of us are pushing changes uh, across party lines that we hope will We'll reach the finish line. With that, I'd like to turn it over to um, uh, recently returned uh, and my friend David Guttenberg from Thank the Finance you. Committee. Thank you. Thanks for being here this morning. Yesterday in finance, we had the overview um, on the revenue forecast, and it is a two $250 million um, number in the black, um, which is good. It could have been in the red, but it's in the black. We still have a 2.3 deficit. We continue to rely on deficit spending and our savings. No business would use the model we have um, uh, to, to manage its own resources. We're doing a horrible job of it, and we need to understand we have, um, we have to get the state on sound fiscal ground. Continue this deficit spending will not work. It won't work for the people of the state of Alaska. In the budget, we restored $19 million to the University of Alaska, which has had um, significant cuts to its budget in the, in the past few years. The university is the economic engine in the state. We have children in the state that need to be educated. We work in this building to create jobs. The university is where they get trained, where they get degrees to manage our resources and to teach our children. It's where we get the research done to protect our communities from um, uh, earthquakes and volcanoes and seismic activity. It is a huge economic engine that we need to be um, conscious of it. 
in the research in the university returned six to one uh, on, on its dollars. Um, Alaska is, uh, it becomes the center of the universe now with the changing Arctic. The university is the place national, internationally where it is renowned for its Arctic research. We need to not lose that focus. So continue funding for the university to su support all of those efforts, our efforts, the people's efforts, um, uh, to keep building a better state. Thank you, Rosemary Guttenberg. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Chair of the Judiciary Committee, uh, Representative Matt Clayman, who, um, uh, who I'm glad is, has always still been with us. And thanks, Les. It's, it's good to be here, and I share the pleased to see Representative Sponholtz and Representative Guttenberg looking healthy and keeping up their pace back here in the Capitol. Here in the judiciary, two of the big things we're looking at at very important on a national level, there's been a real response to the recent tragic shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and House Bill 75 introduced by Representative Tarr has been having a lot of hearings in House Judiciary Committee because we are we're really focused always on how do we improve public safety and we hear the public saying that we need to do something more than we have been doing. It's uh, the House Bill 75 provides for gun violence protective orders, and we're looking very carefully at that because, interestingly enough, as, as the process has gone forward, we're really seeing national support. The NRA actually has come out in support of gun violence protective orders. Yeah, there have been other states. Indiana has passed one. Vice President Pence was, has been very supportive of that. I think President Trump, interestingly enough, is also very supportive of the approach they've taken in Indiana. So we're actually comparing both what they've got in Indiana and Representative Tarr's bill and looking to find a bill where we can show to the public that we've heard them about the need to do more about gun violence while also protecting and really protecting vigilantly Second Amendment rights. An example of working together that, that has gone well here in, the, here in the Capitol is House Bill 312, Crimes Against Medical Professionals, that just passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday. It passed the House 31 to 1 when it was on the House floor, and that's an example of working together to improve public safety. And we're using the same kind of approach to look at House Bill 75 to really find where there can be consensus here in the Capitol to move House Bill 75 forward. And I'm optimistic that the Senate will be hearing House Bill 312, Crimes Against Medical Professionals, here in the next several days. So glad to be here today and glad to continue our work to improve public safety. Thank you, Representative Clayman, and I'm happy to introduce uh, and turn it over to uh, Representative Sponholtz, the chair of the Health and Social Services Committee. Hello, everybody. It is fantastic to be back in the Capitol um, for my second week. So um, before I move on to the, the, the topic of the day, I want to uh, talk a little bit about what we did last week in the Education and uh, Health and Social Services Committee. Representative Harriet Drummond, who chairs education, and I hosted three days of joint committee hearings focusing on uh, the services and the intersection of services provided to families with children ages zero to five uh, in education and health and social services. We did this for two reasons. One is it's essential that we are, you know, being efficient with our increasingly precious state resources. We want to make sure that we're not, uh, you know, wasting any funds. But secondarily, this uh, zero to age five, t five age range is one of the most important times in a child's brain development. Decisions that we make and the care that they get in, their, in that zero to five age range affects them for the rest of their lives. And so we know if we properly invest in this, we can improve their health and educational outcomes as well as workforce readiness and ability to contribute as members of society for the rest of their lives. So. Um, I'm really pleased to report that we heard that through uh, the Alaska Early Childhood Coordinating Council, we learned that the departments are coordinating very closely. Um, we also learned that uh, the departments have been making really smart choices with their resources. Um, in light of budget cuts. And a good example of that is in the Department of Public Health. Public health nursing used to serve all children ages 0 to eight, 18. Now, because of budget cuts, they had to make some tough decisions, and they decided to focus their resources on children in the 0 to 5 age range, which I think was a really smart decision on their part. Um, 
We also learned that the uh, AECCC could probably do a better job if they're staffed. This organization isn't staffed right now, and so that's something that we're going to be looking at in the future. And we heard from the Juno Economic Development Council that uh, investing in this zero to age five, five range was, will save us money over the long term and result in a better prepared and more educated workforce. So Juno is using this as an economic development strategy. And I think that's something that I'd like to see in Anchorage and in other communities throughout the state. Um, so back to budget. Uh, last week passed the uh, supplemental budget. This is really important um, for two reasons. One is it, uh, you know, just is an example of how the House and Senate can work together. Our co-chairs of finance on both sides, you know, coordinated and we passed a uh, fast track supplemental budget, which ensured that we can continue to fund Medicaid providers through the end of this month. That's really important because they're out there providing services to people on Medicaid that we're required by law to provide those services to. When we have an obligation, a debt that, that must be paid, we need to make sure that we can pay it. So I look forward to um, you know, the, uh, the regular supplemental budget passing shortly and the operating budget where we're going to address, uh, we're, we'll address some of these topics again. On the operating budget, because that's really the topic of today and the next couple of days, um, you know, I want to point out that our budget, um, uh, it, it's a, increases, it's a modest increase over uh, the governor's proposal and over last year. Um, but I think that those increases are well justified. We are focusing on public education and on public safety. Those are the two most important things that government does for the people of Alaska. Um, we have, uh, we've invested $19 million in the university. The university drives innovation, workforce readiness, and keeps bright kids in Alaska. I don't want to see the brain drain that took place in the 80s happen again. Uh, that, that was hard on our economy for decades, and so we need to make sure we're properly investing. We're, um, in, with regard to public safety, we're investing in five additional prosecutors and in five additional staff for public defenders. We need people on both sides of the aisle in, their, in our criminal justice system to make sure that we're prosecuting cases. And what we found and heard from prosecutors is they're not prosecuting cases because they don't have the capacity to do it. So our budget makes sure that we have those extra staffing in there so that we can make sure our criminal justice system is working uh, and we can uh, work on getting ahead of crime in Alaska. So. Thanks. Thank you. We'll open it up for questions. Uh, James Brooks from the Juno Empire for both Representative Sponholz and Representative Guttenberg. How is your health? Are you both at 100% and should we expect anything else this year? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'll go first because she's still laughing. Uh, um, I, I'm actually better than I was before I went in. I, um, uh, um, you know, I have some weight issues, losing weight, doing all those things, um, changing the diet is important things. These are all issues that are affect all of us. Um, I'm doing well. Go into the hospital, get all kinds of tests and come out and say, you're pretty good, just, here's a, just need to take care of this, was reassuring for me and for my family. 